Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our panel today, Repast and Present Food History Inside and Outside of the Academy. My name is Amanda Herbert. I'm head of fellowships at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC. And I'm also the editor for a digital humanities, humanities H STEM project called the Recipes Project. The reason that I mentioned the Recipes Project is that this panel marks the launch of a new digital initiative at the RP, an online conference. For the next month, we'll be hosting a series of digital conversations around the theme, what is a recipe? These include individual blog posts, YouTube videos, tweet storms, and live streamed events, just like the one we're doing today, because today's panel is the first of our programs. We're live streaming, streaming it on our Facebook page right now. We'll be taking questions from the audience uh, at the end of our presentation today, and also from all of your fellow attendees who are watching around the world. My first great pleasure is to introduce our speakers. I'm just going to mention them by name so that you can affiliate or associate names with faces, and then I'll be giving their full bios before they speak. Our speakers today include Amanda Moniz, Tandra Taylor, you guys can wave if you want, <laughs> Zara and Anna Shonslin, Paula Johnson, and Marissa Nicosia. I do also want to mention the format of today's panel. This is a lightning round or a lightning panel, which at the Berks means that each of our presenters are going to give a slightly briefer presentation, seven to ten minutes maybe. And then most of our time will be devoted to question and answer with the audience, both here in the room with us here in Hofstra and then also, as I mentioned, around the world. Thank you for joining us. Okay, our first speaker is Amanda Moniz, who's the David M. Rubenstein Curator of Philanthropy at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. An early American historian, she received her doctorate at the University of Michigan and held a Cassius Marcellus Clay postdoctoral fellowship at Yale University. Her book, From Empire to Humanity, The American Revolution and the Origins of Humanitarianism, published in 2016, won Arnova's first Peter Dobkin Hall History of Philanthropy Prize. Congratulations, Amanda. Building on her background as a former pastry chef, she has also developed and taught hands-on historic cooking and baking classes at a local cultural center and Washington, D.C. schools. Her food history work has been published in the Washington Post, The Recipes Project, American Food Roots, and she's been featured on the Kojo Nandi show as well as other radio shows. Welcome, Amanda Moniz. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amanda, for the introduction and for putting together this panel and inviting me to be on it. I'm really delighted to be here. So as you heard when Amanda introduced me, I am a historian of philanthropy. Uh, my position is as a curator of philanthropy. And so you may be wondering, what am I doing here? I do have a food history background, but that's not what I work on currently. So I want to talk a little bit about the role that food history has played in my professional development and career, uh, what I've learned from it, and where I may go with it in coming years. The food history offers opportunities uh, to engage broad publics um, in the study of the past. And it, it also offers historians, I think, opportunities uh, to uh, expand their career options. And, and that's what I, I want to tell you about. Uh, today. As Amanda mentioned, uh, I have a, before I was a historian, I was a pastry chef. Uh, after college, I spent several years work, I did a culinary, a pastry arts program. Uh, I spent several years working in restaurants in New York City as a pastry chef. Uh, then I decided I missed history and I wanted to go to grad school and I applied and thought I was leaving, uh, applied to grad school, got in and thought I was leaving pastry behind. I mean, I knew I'd always bake and cook. I've been baking and cooking all my life, but I thought professionally that that was over with. And for many years, I, I didn't pursue it in any kind of professional way. Then after um, I finished, got my degree, I had my postdoc, I was um, adjuncting, working on my book manuscript and sort of casting about for 
a way to um, pursue my career. A bit, you know, I was trying to sort of figure things out. And it suddenly dawned on me that I could use my pastry background to explore history. It just came to me um, one day. So I started um, teaching uh, historic cooking classes at a local cultural um, center in Washington, the Hill Center. Uh, and I was particularly interested in um, a cookbook that had been discovered several years before, before I had this epiphany. Um, the cookbook is by a woman named Melinda Russell. It's um, the first known African-American cookbook. It was published in 1866, and it had been discovered at the Clements Library by, by um, a historian at the Clements Library in Ann Arbor. And a, a, a copy, a facsimile copy was published, and someone had given me it as a, as a gift. And I got really um, drawn into the story of the rediscovery of this cookbook and the un, basically unknown story of Melinda Russell. Um, and the cookbook is great. Um, the recipes are great. So I, I, I got drawn in and realized that I could use these recipes to explore her life a little bit more, see what we could learn about Melinda Russell's life by cooking her recipes, and I, I could explore this with a broader public by teaching hands-on classes. So that's what I did. Um, and I brought um, uh, one of the recipes, I made one of the recipes in the cookbook, her jumbles, um, and you know, they kindly offered to pass it out, and I also brought uh, copies of the recipe. This is, uh, thank you, a cookie that is uh, flavored with rose water and caraway seeds, um, and it, it's, it's, well, I think delicious, so I um, hope you enjoy it. Uh, anyway, so I started teaching these classes and expanded um, to do a repertoire of classes that looked at different eras and episodes in American history, different notable people um, in American history um, at the Hill Center and then also at local schools. And I learned a few things, um, which I'll talk about in a minute. But one of the things I also did, uh, partly because I needed to promote these courses and, and attract an audience and learn more myself, was also develop a blog where I wrote about uh, Melinda Russell and, and other aspects of American history, um, and then started writing for other publications. So, uh, what? Well, uh, so well, some of the things I've, I, I so, so I loved it. I, I found it incredibly gratifying. It was also very educational for me. Uh, I learned a lot about the substantive history of eras I didn't know a whole lot about. I'm an early American historian and studied philanthropy, but this gave me me an opportunity to learn about um, some different eras up to about World War One. I. I didn't really go beyond that. So substance, intellectually, it was um, enriching for me. It also taught me a lot about being a public historian. And I, when I started this endeavor, it, I had been motivated in part by realizing I was trying to, to, to find my way in my career and that I didn't have a lot of public history experience and that this would give me um, a way to add a public history dimension to my CV. And I, I, I I hadn't really thought as much about what I would learn substantively about being a public historian. Uh, so for me, it was very stimulating. Uh, I, I learned, um, one of the things I learned was about shared authority. In, in the classes I would teach, the, the participants would, would wind up sharing their stories. And so I was teaching, I would be taught, plan, you know, have a, a lesson plan, we'd be learning how to bake pie crust or something. And I would also be interspersing that with talking about food history and, the, and whatever other history I was interested in talking about. But the, the participants were always bringing their own stories to it. So I wasn't, you know, teaching the way, you know, like in a lecture class where you're sort of, you know, the authority figure and the students write down what you say. It was much more um, of a shared experience of exploring the history. Uh, so that was one thing. Um, I, I was also really impressed with the kind of questions I got um, from the students and participants, including young people, uh, that were questioning 
um, the nature of uh, the sources I was working with. They were questioning whether or not adapting recipes was legitimate and debating what, you know, the nature of a historian's work interpreting um, sources. Um, and they also um, were, so all of that I found very stimulating. The other thing I found was though that history, food history is very accessible and sometimes I think it can um, be somewhat misleading. It, it can, it can, um, uh, it can make you feel that the, the past is less foreign than it is. You sort of lose track of how foreign the past is because you can relate to the recipe and the food and the stories. So I, that was one thing I sort of grappled with, um, and I'm curious about what other people will say on this point. Uh, so, so that was another thing I, I had to think about. So all of that was incredibly stimulating for me. Now, in addition to being intellectually enriching for me, what I took from these courses was a public history experience I hadn't had that I think has been very valuable in my career development. Uh, when I interviewed for my previous job, I had not been working for a few years full time at adjuncted and stuff. Um, but I, th I, I would have, if I hadn't been doing this, I would not have felt as confident as I did when I interviewed for my previous job and was able to talk about um, this project that was going well and what I was learning from it as a public historian. And I think that helped me get that previous job. Then when I interviewed for this job that I have now at the National Museum of American History, again, I had this um, public history experience that I could draw on and um, talk about. And I think it helped with, with that too. So for me professionally, uh, my public, these, teaching these cooking classes uh, has been professionally important. Now, it's been, um, but food history sort of been on the back burner for me for the past few years as I focused on the history of philanthropy, um, by finishing up my book, um, and get, settling into my new role. But now that I'm uh, in this new context at the museum, I think that there are um, some phenomenal opportunities to, to find new connections uh, between food history and the history of philanthropy using objects, uh, using uh, the opportunities to collaborate with other colleagues at the museum and to develop new uh, projects uh, in this, this new setting. So I'm very excited about where I'll be able to go uh, with this and anticipate that I'll be able to draw connections between food history and philanthropy and look at the history of philanthropy through um, various aspects of food history. So I think I will leave it at that and look forward to questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Next, we have Tandra Taylor. She's earning her PhD in American Studies at St. Louis University. Tandra has an MA in His uh, Heritage Preservation from Georgia State University and received her BA in French in 2006 from Spelman College. She's won fellowships from several organizations, including the Southern Foodways Alliance, and has research interests in slave gardens, the agricultural society, history and society of St. Louis, and Caribbean and African diasporic studies. Welcome, Tandra. Thank you, Amanda, for that introduction, and good morning, everybody. Um, it's a privilege to be a part of this amazing panel. Um, each of us all together bringing our different perspectives on food history. It's good to hear that um, I'm here with a lot of other public historians. That's what my MA is in. And when I started my PhD program at SLU, it seemed as though I'd lost that part of my identity as a public historian. So, I'm interested in food in a number of different ways, and I define myself as a food historian. For the last four years, I've been wrestling with this complex relationship between black women, food, and identity. I've actually been wrestling with this really complex relationship for the larger part of my life. I remember being a young child, knowing almost instinctively that food and food practices were cultural and class markers. 
why else would my grandmother refuse certain foods altogether or only deny some of them in public spaces? So those memories drove my impulses to better understand black women's relationship to food. So through my exploration of how these topics are intersecting, why they're complex, and all of these things, I discovered collections of compelling photographs. So my dissertation is not a visual cultural analysis, and I definitely didn't know we'd be in this wonderful room. Otherwise, I've been prepared to show um, some of these um, images that got me to this place in my study. Um, but these images um, were of early uh, African-American women at Hampton and Tuskegee Institutes. And these were images of progressive era women dressed modestly with starched white aprons um, and white doily covered heads. And I remember thinking, gee, this is odd. Um, black women's entrance into modernity, if you will, through these photographs still seem like they're holding on to the past in very strange ways. Um, and what I mean by that is, for me, the images held a riddle. So we have African-American women trying to present themselves as modern, um, respectable women, but in many ways, the images call attention to the legacy of the manic figure. So, for me, my search to understand this relationship got tangled with my search to solve the riddle that I saw in the images. I thought, why do women one and a half generations removed from enslavement need formal instruction in cooking and domestic tasks? Moreover, if domestic work remained one of the only industries open to black women regardless of education, what are these images trying to communicate? I continued to obsess over the riddle and discovered um, a lesser known school, not as well known as Hampton and Tuskegee, but the National Training School for Women and Girls in Washington, D.C. Its founder, Nanny Helen Burroughs, educator, social activist, who operated the school from 1909 to 19, her death in 1961, was what I call a master rhetorician. Um, the school was largely funded by lots of small donations from uh, African Americans, um, as well as others, and steady fundraising efforts from Burroughs. The School of the Three Bs, the Bible, the Bath, and the Room, as Burroughs once described it in a capital campaign, um, quote, specialized in the holy impossible, end quote. And for Burroughs, a part of the holy impossible was a way in which um, black women's own uplift would therefore be tied to the uplift of the race itself. So for Burroughs, she called this task that uh, was set before her that she takes on the holy impossible. So where does the images of the students, like those at Hampton and Tuskegee, um, and Burroughs' rhetoric, you know, including things like the School of the Three Bs, um, would suggest that the school, the National Institute, uh, I'm sorry, National Training School for Women and Girls, had a real focus on domestic science and prioritized this in the curriculum as a part of an uplift movement for black women and the black race in general. The archive proved otherwise. I'd imagine that I'd find an abundance of source material, particularly related to food, given the images of the kitchens um, and the types of language that Burroughs is using. What I found actually was that the records of the domestic science department were not as well intact as those, say for example, um, students who were studying sociology or Negro history at the time. Um, but what I found in the archive wasn't enough for me to prove what I thought I found, was that Burroughs was running this covert operation. I just didn't have it there, so I'm like, okay, so now where do we go? So what does a food historian do when she gets to the archive and can't find any source material related to food? Well, she tries to solve the riddle. 
So incidentally, I found a letter from Carter G. Woodson, who was at Howard University as an administrator at the time, so in Northeast DC, less than 10 miles away from Burroughs' school. And in an appeal for contributions to the National Training School, Woodson remarked, Burroughs is doing a work which neither the public schools nor the university can do. For Woodson, Burroughs' school satisfied what he called a real need. The other schools, declared Woodson, have their spheres, and the National Training School has its special sphere. Why did Woodson delineate these institutions? And why had Burroughs been in conversation with the Home Economics Department at Howard University, less than 10 miles away? And Howard is where I would find the other two um, central social historical actors, Fleming Kittrell and Cecil Hoover Edwards, um, about whom we know very little, if anything. Um, so I left the archive with more questions than I had answers, but I knew I had something. So then I remember um, culinary anthropologist Verda Mae Grosvenor is recanting this experience she had in a grocery store in 1970s New York. And Grosvenor was in an aisle in a grocery store, and she was shocked um, when a white passersby child says to his mom, look ma, a real Aunt Jemima. And um, Grosvenor's experience highlights this thing, this, this riddle that I'm chasing, the perennial tension between black women, domestic, domestic work, I'm sorry, and identity. So since emancipation, black women have been haunted by the legacy of the unrefined, buffoonish domestic servant, the mammy figure. And as with Grosvenor's broadcasting career, black women have attempted to create counter identities that challenge this popular stereotype. So higher education um, popularized during the progressive era promised to deliver a devastating blow to this um, pervasive image for black women. Yet regardless of race, domestic science constituted a core component of women's education at the time. The emphasis on domesticity posed a particular conundrum for black women seeking social mobility, though, because on one hand, you have black women trying to get away from the legacy, but it's, it's almost uh, impossible for them to do so. Um, so you have this fight that African American women are in by the 1880s to construct new identities for themselves. And and as much as it seems at odds that the way in which black women would create new identities would be through domestic science education, to an extent, this was one of the only vehicles they had to kind of like uh, move forward. And so this is kind of getting to the unpacking for me at least of the riddle. Um, So, so what I found, though, in, in scholarship that's been published that we know um, about early experiences um, in education for black women, um, it, it's surprising to me that no one has tried to figure this out. So African-American women's historians have directed their scrutiny to black women's identity construction. Then you have educational historians who um, are concerned with the debates on the appropriate types of schooling for marginalized groups such as blacks and women. Um, my project kind of intervenes um, in looking at the dialectal nature of the relationship of black women to the field of domestic science. And my study does two things. Um, I'm looking at how black women demand domestic science training to reshape their individual lives and collective fortunes since the turn of the century and how black women impacted the field of domestic science, um, which later turned into home economics, which later turned into nutrition. And so by bringing Burroughs in conversation um, with Fleming Kittrell and Cesar Edwards at Howard University, I'm able to see three distinct and sometimes overlapping time periods that gives uh, an opportunity 
to examine a broad swath of time from 1909 to 1980, um, what African American women are bringing to um, the, these particular changing fields. And as the fields change, I'm looking at how these women's approaches to their work is also changing. Um, So, my dissertation tells the story of how African American women mobilized the fact of domestic labor to prove their womanhood. While on the surface, um, it appears that domestic science would be unlikely um, and reinforce negative imagery of black women's gender, race, and class subordination. The answer to the riddle is that African American women's participation in these types of programs may well be considered a subversive act rather than a subservient one. And for African American women, cooking class was really a way to cultivate new identities. To put it another way, for them, cooking class was actually cooking class, a self-defining act within a social structure with, with limited possibilities. So I um, I'm very happy to be here again um, and hope that this is a very generative space and look forward to the Q&A portion at the end of this discussion. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Tandra. That was terrific. All right. Next up, we have Zara Anna Shanslin, who's Assistant Professor of History and Art History at the University of Delaware. She previously taught at CUNY, the College of Staten Island, and at Columbia, where she also co-chaired the Columbia Seminar on Early American History and Culture. Anna Shanslin was a postdoctoral fellow at the New York Historical Society and Johns Hopkins University, and she received her PhD in the History of American Civilization at the University of Delaware in 2009, where her dissertation won the prize for the best dissertation in the humanities. In 2011, it also won the University of Pennsylvania Zuckerman Prize in American Studies. And that prize-winning dissertation was turned into her first book, Portrait of a Woman in Silk, Hidden Histories of the British Atlantic World, which was released by Yale University Press just this year in 2016. Congratulations, Zara. She can also be found talking history on the Travel Channel's Mysteries at the Museum show. Please join me in welcoming Zara. Thank you, Amanda, and thank all of you for um, joining us early in the morning. Um, just forgive me one moment while I try to figure out how to pull up my PowerPoint, which seems to require a password. Oh, there it is. Okay. Bear with me. It's a long password. <laughs> This is just like when you're trying to give a lecture to undergrads, you have to ask your freshman how to help you <laughs> open up the... Well, I'm logging into my <laughs> <laughs> This is the problem of being a Mac user. You can't, you can't do the PCs. There we go. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. Okay. Apologies for that. All right. It's showing up the way it should be. Um, again, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Amanda, for the organization of the panel and for including me on it. It's a real pleasure to be here and for what everyone's working on. Um, and I echo what people have said about um, integrating public history into our other intellectual pursuits. I think it's really important and I'm glad to be a small part of it today. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, teaching, though, um, and bringing food into the classroom. Um, one of the things I teach is Atlantic world history, and as any of you who study Atlantic world history know, teaching and learning it can be a really depressing thing. Um, it requires thinking about the causes, courses, and effects of some of the more horrific events in early modern history, such as the enforced migration of millions of enslaved Africans, 
to Europe's Atlantic colonies, and the actions of this guy on the right, Christopher Columbus, um, including the systematic rape, torture, murder, dismemberment of thousands of indigenous people. So, you know, good morning, right? This is a great way to start this off. Yeah, what I'm going to talk about today is the fact that Atlantic world history also has its more uplifting aspects. After all, it's a story of creation as well as destruction. Native Americans, European, and African people came together in cooperation as well as conflict. And exchanges among Native Americans, Africans, and Europeans fundamentally transformed cultures, politics, economies, and of most interest to this forum, food and recipes on both sides of the Atlantic. And chances are, whatever recipes you regularly eat, at least a few of them owe their existence to transatlantic exchange between the 15th and 19th centuries. So beginning with Christopher Columbus's first voyage to the Caribbean in 1492, as you, all of you I'm sure know, plants, animals, and diseases new to Native Americans arrived in the Americas and Caribbean, while plants, animals, and diseases new to Europe and Africa similarly made a transatlantic journey in the opposite direction. In addition to well-known commodities like tobacco, sugar, coffee, and cocoa, that transverse the Atlantic, more prosaic crops, animals, and germs cross the Atlantic at times accidentally. Things like pigs, cattle, horses, wheat, dandelions, rice, and smallpox traveled west. Things like sweet potatoes, potatoes, corn, turkeys, guinea pigs, tomatoes, and perhaps syphilis traveled east. And such exchange forms formed roots of what has become known as the Columbian Exchange um, after Alfred Crosby's term in the seminal 1972 book of the same name. So as an example of this, um, I decided to think of what I could do with this in terms of teaching Atlantic world history. Um, and I started with this map as a way to get into this, this issue of what the Columbian Exchange could bring to the classroom in studying Atlantic world history. Um, when the ship of French explorer Samuel de Champlain ran aground in what he called Port Saint Louis in 1605 in modern day Massachusetts, he described seeing gardens and fields filled with beans and corn, which you can see here, inhabited by Native Americans who met the Frenchmen in canoes filled with freshly caught cod. Native American food and crops captivated the imagination of Europeans like Champlain. And I think this is evident from his map, um, which took care to illustrate the lushly tall fields of corn as well as the items of navigational interest. So what Champlain called Port Saint Louis became better known as Plymouth, Massachusetts. 15 years after his visit, English colonists famously arrived there and described a very different place, a depopulated community so devastated by smallpox that the Native Americans had not even been able to bury their dead and their bones were found on the ground. So such were the disastrous effects of the Columbian Exchange. But what I'd like to talk about today, what I did with my class, is to think about Champlain's corn in his map. Um, because in the corn, it also excuse it, uh, carries this map, if you'll excuse the pun, seeds for teaching other at times much less devastating aspects of the Columbian Exchange. In particular, its impact on global consumption patterns, cuisine, and recipes. Corn, of course, was a fundamental staple um, in uh, indigenous peoples of the Americas in North and South America, important enough to embody religious meanings to cultures like the Aztecs, who worshipped cows, who you see here. Um, and corn held very different symbolic meanings, though, across the Atlantic. There, along with tobacco, palm trees, and parrots, um, and representations of Native American bodies, corn became an iconographic symbol of exoticism, often using maps, paintings like the Dutch one you see there, sculpture and ceramics. But Indian corn, like many other plants and animals that traverse the Atlantic, ended up on tables as well in Europe, Africa, and Asia. It wasn't just symbolic. So what does teaching and learning about the Columbian Exchange look like if, to take this single example, I ask students to think more deeply about corn? Um, what were the long-term effects of food like corn crossing the Atlantic? What does following a plant like corn back and forth across the sea tell us about change in taste in Europe and Asia, and about the ability of Native Americans and Africans to retain cultural heritage in no small part through culinary techniques and ingredient choices, and about the hybrid food practices of new Creole cultures established in the Americas and Caribbean? So in my class, one of the things I um, subject students to, and they usually like it, is Sidney Mintz's fascinating book, Sweetness and Power, The Place of Sugar in Modern History. So they're well aware of the often devastating and destructive, but always transformative effects of people's desire to consume and produce an edible commodity like sugar. But the histories of life and labor on an 18th century Jamaican sugar plantation, and here I'm going to echo what some others have said, can seem like the histories of Native Americans, French and English in 17th century Massachusetts, very far away and inaccessible to students today. So what would students um, look at Atlantic world history, 
What would their view be like through a more personal, a more personally meaningful lens due to their understanding of these faraway histories of contact and exchange? What would choosing recipes they love based on food that migrated transatlantically through the plundering exchange tell students not only about the past, but offer them a chance to reflect upon the past through the lens of their own families and taste buds? How would it eliminate the theoretical concept of something like globalization? What would happen, in short, if students researched the recipes of the Columbian Exchange? So this is exactly what I asked my students at CUNY to do. And I should say here that I think that one of the reasons this worked so well was that I was teaching at CUNY, which is a very diverse population, many students of color. Um, in particular, in this class, I had a majority of Latino and African American students. And that was actually a really great way to explore um, their own personal heritage as a, as a way to understand Atlantic world history. What I asked them to do was to choose a recipe. Um, the only criteria were that it has to be one that would not exist were it not for the fact of the Columbian Exchange. And it must be an actual recipe with more than one ingredient. So I, I didn't want them to say, you know, corn, right? So it actually had to be a recipe. They had to describe the recipe, its ingredients, its name, and provide information on how it's cooked. And then second, go into more analytical and historical detail about it. Um, what were the environmental origins of its ingredients? Which ones are those we can trace to the Columbian Exchange? Who first made it and where? Why is the recipe important to you? And what does it tell us about the contact between peoples and the exchanges of things that characterized Atlantic world history? Um, now, as you might guess from uh, the slide that's currently up, the student's initial reaction to this was not positive. As um, one of my best students, Jose Hernandez, summed up the initial reaction to finding a recipe assignment on the syllabus, when you first assigned the Columbian Exchange assignment, I honestly assumed that you were giving us busy work, um, always what a student, uh, professor wants to hear. <laughs> However, once the students dove into the assignment, their reactions quickly changed. To quote Jose again, once I started researching, I realized that this was a legit assignment. Um, yes, it was legit, and it actually, in the end, I think was very successful. Um, it enhanced student understanding of the Columbian Exchange as a truly transformative global phenomenon and gave students a personal thing, tangible thing to hold on to as they struggle to understand this faraway history. Um, it also provided them with new and at times surprising knowledge about their favorite foods. And we did this right before Thanksgiving and many of them um, came back after the Thanksgiving break to tell me that this had become a lively topic of conversation at their Thanksgiving dinner table. So, you know, if nothing else, hearing that the history class knowledge went out to a family dinner table. That's a win, I would say. So let me highlight um, just a few um, things that the students contributed because I think that they are interesting and informative. Um, one of the things that many students focused on was meat. Um, so among things that Europeans introduced to the Americas were the meat of pigs and cows. Um, and they became staple features of creolized cuisine, but many students didn't realize that these were not things that were in the Americas before. Um, the Columbian Exchange. And students worked on a number of these recipes. Um, student Brian Howe, for example, who was engaged to a Puerto Rican woman, woman um, said that this was a way for him to feel connected to, he was of um, primarily Anglo descent, and he said this was a way for him to feel really connected to his fiance's family. He researched the empanadilla, which he said had to, quote, make a lot of trips back and forth across the Atlantic to be what it is, and what it is is freaking delicious. <laughs> um, and so he found this was a way for him to really connect to this fiance's family, as well as, um, I think, I suspect that he made her cook it for him, which is another issue altogether. Um, another student, Cynthia Vera, researched a, another meat-based recipe, one that she termed a Latin spin on a European croquette, and here you see her recipe here. Um, and she really enjoyed doing this because it was something that her grandmother cooked for her, and she felt that this was um, a really interesting way for her to connect with her, with her grandmother across generations as well, discussing this. Um, so while the beef that was a result of European colonization um, was you know, coming across the Atlantic this way, um, corn and potatoes were essential to American indigenous people's diets and went the other way. And um, as Cynthia Vera actually put it when she was researching her Rianus de Papa, um, growing up Puerto Rican and Ecuadorian, I did not get the sense that my culture was heavily influenced by anything other but other Hispanic cultures. But researching her chosen food, she found otherwise, and um, qualified recipes like Rianus de Papa as speaking volumes to the original cultures that did not allow themselves to be swallowed up, but instead were reborn into something else that has become a signature for today's people. And in particular, she focused on um, potatoes as, and corn as what she called ingredients of abundance, which I thought was a really great phrase, and I'm going to steal from her all the time. 
Um, so the other thing that many students focused on was, uh, was the use of rice in dishes, in particular as a way to trace um, the retention of African labor techniques as well as culinary techniques, um, despite forced enslavement uh, across the Atlantic. And um, a number of the students who looked at these dishes um, really enjoyed tracing that retention of African heritage. Um, another group of students, on the other hand, focused on recipes um, that traveled east from the Americas to Europe and eventually India and Asia, which was really interesting. Um, some had legends attached to them. Student Ashley Olivetti delved into her grandmother's Italian red tomato sauce recipe and found, among other things, that uh, Europeans at first feared tomatoes in part because they're part of the family, um, including deadly nightshades like belladonna, a poisonous plant that, according to Germanic folklore, witches used to summon werewolves. So she found this revelatory because she never thought thinking about her Nona's red sauce would lead her to witches and werewolves, but you know, another interesting dinner table conversation. Um, other students uh, looked at recipes that arose due to um, the far-flung empires of, uh, of countries like Britain going out of the Atlantic and into the Pacific, and this was particularly fascinating. Um, uh, one student, Remy Rodney, researched his grandmother's Jamaican soup, a dish that reflects the global reach of the British in its chicken, pumpkins, yams, and Korean dumplings. Um, student Harmon Chan, who's of Japanese descent, looked at Japanese rice and potato curry um, and found that it was first found in Japanese cookbooks in 1872, and it's now a very popular standby in Japan, um, but it had its beginnings not long before it first appeared in this cookbook, after American Commodore Matthew Perry's 1853 visit um, began a new era of Japanese trade with uh, Western nations, including Britain. Um, and among the things that the British introduced to Japan were curry from India and potatoes from America. So um, Harmon's recipe um, looked at not just how the Atlantic world and Columbian exchange um, created new, new cuisines, um, but also how that melded with um, the expanse of the Atlantic into the Pacific, which as a historian from a historiographical perspective, I find really fascinating because it's sort of what is happening in the field of Atlantic world history at large, right? We're being told now that the Atlantic's not enough. We need to go Pacific and we need to go global. So this is what the food was doing before us. Um, so, to sum it up, um, as one student put it, food is one way people define their cultures. And as students learned by researching recipes of the Columbian Exchange, food is one way people maintain old cultures and create new ones too. And I found this to be a really successful way of making the 15th and 16th and 17th and 18th centuries, which feel so far away for students so often, um, things that were personally meaningful. And if nothing else, I don't know what else they'll remember from this course, but I know for sure they'll remember researching these recipes and the fact that some of these things exist because of transatlantic exchange. Um, and in their case in particular, um, one of their big takeaways was um, that this was a, an inspirational story to counter the so often destructive um, story of enslavement and rape and torture and murder, that this was something that was about creation and retention. And so it, they found it a really inspirational counterpoint to some of those other narratives. Um, and to conclude, if you're wondering, we did have a feast, and it was delicious. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Next up, we have Paula Johnson, a curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, where she oversees the food history and marine resources collections. Johnson, Johnson was on the team that collected Julia Childs' home kitchen in 2001 and co-curated the Bon Appetit exhibition 2002 to 2012. I loved that exhibition. I'm sure many of us feel the same way. As project director and co-curator of the new exhibition, Food, Transforming the American Table, she has helped shape the museum's research, collecting, exhibitions, and programming around food history. Johnson, a folklorist and public historian, has conducted field research on many topics and published two books on the Chesapeake Bay. She has worked in museums since 1981. Welcome, Paula. Thank you, Amanda. Now it's my turn to find Canada. Okay. 
Welcome everyone. It's great to see um, the room filling up. We had a very early start, so it's wonderful to see um, so many folks out there now. Um, I'm really delighted to be part of this panel. I can see already how what we've been talking about uh, really, uh, we all relate to each other and I can't wait to get to the conversation uh, in a bit. Um, but I am here today. Uh, my focus is on food history at the Smithsonian's National 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 Square. Over the past several years, the museum has very deliberately deepened and broadened its attention to food and culinary history, paralleling the growth of food studies in academia and the widespread interest in food-related topics and issues uh, that we've seen among journalists, policymakers, and the general public. Food history has emerged uh, for us as an effective lens for examining many aspects of American history in a cross-disciplinary and very accessible way for our public. Uh, for purposes of this panel, I'm going to focus on one of our new initiatives, a, a regularly scheduled program that blends history with a live cooking demonstration inside the museum. Um, this is a brave new world for us. You know, having fire in the middle of the museum is always, you know, exciting. Um, and we believe uh, this is also a brave new world for our public. Um, it's but one example of our work that is uh, really changing the conversation about history uh, at the museum. So I want to take just a moment to connect how this idea of cooking in the museum emerged out of our research, our collecting, and our exhibition efforts. And of course, I'm happy to give credit where credit is due, and that would be to our muse, Julia Child, mm -hmm. uh, America's beloved cooking teacher, author, television star. Um, as uh, Amanda noted, the museum collected Julia Child's kitchen, all 1,200 parts and pieces of it from her home in Cambridge, Massachusetts, back in 2001. Um, the kitchen is and remains one of the museum's most popular objects, and it's been on view uh, by and large for the past 15 years. First in this dedicated gallery, um, and then since 2012 within, within a much larger exhibition uh, that explores some of the big changes in American food since 1950, um, food transforming the American table. Our team, uh, that we always work in teams where it's a very collaborative um, uh, type of work, working in the museum. Our team um, had always harbored a dream, though, to not only display Julia's kitchen, um, where she cooked for family and friends for about 40 years and where three of her television programs were filmed, uh, but to create an adjacent space where we could actually do you know, what she did best, which is engage everybody uh, in a dynamic exploration of ingredients, of culinary techniques, recipes, of traditional knowledge, and history. And since July of 2015, we've been able to do just that with our demonstration kitchen, one that was specially designed and built for us, um, which in essence carries out Julia Child's legacy in a dynamic, uh, sensory, and experiential way. So thus began um, an ambitious experiment uh, two years ago almost uh, to the day a program uh, we prototyped called Food Fridays, where every Friday for six months we presented not one, but two cooking demonstrations um, framed around an historical topic, an artifact, a book, an event, uh, or a person. In terms of concept development, we ensured that there was always a very strong component uh, that re reflected the museum's research program, its collections, its exhibitions. We worked with partners to make it happen. Um, we're not only collaborative on the inside, but also with lots of other people on the outside. Um, Sir Le Tab, Le Creuset, and others donated all of the cookware and the utensils that we used. Wegmans provided all of the food each week. And we worked with chefs whose time was covered by their employers, Wegmans, Sir Le Tab, Restaurant Associates, and the Academy de, de Cuisine. Um, there's a Smithsonian host. Um, who was also the main researcher on the project. We worked very closely together. Jessica Carbone, who is seen here with holding the mic. Um, and she uh, has a background in, um, in cookbook editing. She learned from Judith Jones, you know, Julia Child's editor. Uh, but she also had a back, has a background in theater, which is fantastic because she turned out to be 
not only a terrific researcher, but a host for what was essentially a live program without a set script. Um, which isn't to say that there was no script at all, but you know, when you're cooking, things happen. You gotta, you know, go with it. Um, so Jessica produces extensive research notes and a heavily annotated timeline uh, that follows the steps in the cooking demo for each program. So in terms of our, our goals for audience engagement, we were working to provide a really different kind of program that would involve our audience in thinking about food history. Um, thinking about culture, about gender, about race, about region in a more dynamic, interactive way. Um, among our challenges, uh, cooking in the middle of the museum means we have a killer exhaust fan. Uh, you can see it above the cooking island. Um, but it quickly removes all of the olfactory dimension of cooking, which is kind of you know, too bad, because um, we really wanted this to be more sensory. Um, but man, you know, that, that fan is amazing. Um, and also, since we're not licensed food professionals, we, we really can't serve the food we cook uh, from the stage. But we are able to work with our um, <clears throat> cafe chef to prepare dishes for purchase um, in the museum cafe. So, we jumped in with both feet on July 5th, 2015, with a chef from San Francisco, Chef Curtis Aikens. And he cooked dishes from his Georgian childhood, um, basically set a very high bar for our subsequent programs. Um, he proved to us that there was an audience that was very interested in hearing about people's backgrounds, about their uh, stories, their recipes from the past, and to watch them prepare food um, in the museum. Uh, he also proved that our plaza set up could happen. Uh, you know, you, you prototype things, you build something, you try it out, and you're just very relieved when it works the way you think it's going to work. Um, so within our prototyping period of the first six months, we produced 23 unique programs on such diverse topics as um, food movements that changed America. So on the 46th anniversary of Woodstock, uh, we prepared some signature foods from the festival, um, from the free kitchen. Uh, we explored how food at Woodstock reflected the period's changing notions about food access and quality. And, you know, we also discovered that there were some of our colleagues who were actually there and they had their own tales to tell about food at Woodstock. Um, or not food at Woodstock, <laughs> everything else. Um, we also did a program on Puerto Rico cultural traditions. Um, Chef Alex Strong, who is a restaurant associate and works at the World Bank, um, shared some of her favorite recipes from her childhood in Puerto Rico and growing up in the Bronx. Um, there were lots of these amazing, great stories about the differences between ingredients in Puerto Rico and in the U.S., how that affected a dish, and what you know her abuela had to say about it. Um, she was not happy about what was available at the bodega in the Bronx. Um, this program really allowed us to look at the blend of Spanish and African and Taino and American influences that have shaped this uh, cocina criolla. Um, each program involves library and archival research and a great deal of planning and coordination and you know other members of the staff who are um, uh, supporting the, the, uh, the whole effort. Um, but I, I'm showing you these notes. Um, these are the notes for just one program. Um, we are archiving uh, the research notes, the bibliographies, the photographs, and the recipes to ensure that this foundation of material uh, will not be lost. It's a valuable resource, and uh, we want to make sure we hang on to it. So throughout the uh, prototyping period, we were constantly evaluating, seeking feedback from the staff, from the audiences, and from our partners. And we then use that feedback um, to recalibrate grade the program um, and have developed uh, a new model, uh, one that is, um, makes a huge difference for staff sanity. It's one program a month instead of uh, one every week. Uh, but this allows us for uh, deeper research and a tighter focus um, for what we're doing. And it also allows for a, a more manageable media plan, um, social media, and the like. Um, we're able to really advertise these things in a different way. 
So our most successful programs um, have these ingredients, if you will. Um, when a chef has personal stories that connect to the larger history and uh, the food and the recipe. For example, March 12th of last year on Museum Day Live, which was a, a program <clears throat> uh, focusing on women and girls of color, and it was an NEH, uh, White House, and Smithsonian program. And we welcome to the stage Alice uh, Randall and Carolyn Randall Williams. Uh, Alice is at Vanderbilt, and Carolyn at the time was at West Virginia University, a uh, mother-daughter duo that had just uh, published their book, Soul Food Love. Um, they cooked from and talked about their family's uh, soul food traditions, which were passed down over four generations of women. Um, so as they cooked, they discussed how the ingredients and the styles of cooking reveal um, you know, the food's fundamental role in their history from slavery to the Harlem Renaissance, from the Civil Rights Movement to the present day. Um, some of their stories brought the plaza to silence. And you have to just imagine a plaza holds about 300 people sitting in chairs, and it was packed with um, uh, young women um, of color who had uh, participated in various activities throughout the day. And um, they talked about how, for example, the kitchen was at times a site of, of violence and assault for black women and cooks during slavery. How segregation in Memphis led a grandmother to form a very strong social club for African American women. They carried forward lots of ideas about what it means to be a hostess in terms of food as well as the social, social rituals. Our programs are also most successful when there are connections to larger topics uh, and uh, issues of interest. For example, uh, foods of the civil rights movement, where we asked, you know, what were the foods that that nourished the civil rights movement? Um, we cooked with some of the we cooked um, with a, a chef again here from Surlitab, um, and these were dishes that fed the organizers of the sit-ins, the boycotts, and, and the marches. Um, she showed some of the ways in which Southern flavors developed, um, often with homemade ingredients and slow and low cooking. Um, we discussed the importance of these foods to the students, to the churches, and to the civil rights organizations of the period. Um, you can see that after the program with the public, there is a lot of dialogue. People swarm the stage and talk to, to the chef, um, talk to our, our historian, a host, and then backstage, there's a moment where our family and friends can, um, can taste the food, but also to connect with each other. Um, our, our program is also strong in, uh, you know, what the museum does. Uh, presidential history is something that is always of interest to people who come to the American History Museum. So we did a program on Abraham Lincoln in the kitchen, basically comparing uh, the childhood food traditions of uh, Lincoln and Mary Todd, uh, very different backgrounds in terms of class, uh, where they grew up, Indiana, Kentucky, um, you know, uh, uh, a homestead and, um, you know, in a uh, large plantation uh, that was served by um, enslaved people. So we talked about those two different experiences and how that played into the kinds of food from their uh, childhood and what they brought forth together um, in the White House. Um, so we cooked yeah, chicken fricassee and the Portland cake. And if you look, here's the um, recipe for Mary Todd's Portland cake. Uh, the, all of our recipes are online. Um, and this kind of shows the dimensions of the Atlantic world. I mean, grand, uh, sugar, vanilla, um, there was even some rum uh, in it. And so we were able to talk about um, where those ingredients came from and why they were something that was just regular for Mary Todd, but certainly not for uh, Abraham Lincoln in Indiana. Um, our um, uh, programs are also very strong when we collaborate with other Smithsonian Bureau and this is an example. We brought um, Chef Jerome Grant, who is the rock star of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, to our stage. And he cooked food in the Great Migration, uh, food that reflects the culinary changes that emerged from that large movement of people. 
Um, and so uh, this is a recipe that he cooked, oxtail pepper pot. He also cooked up collard greens and uh, the box lunch, uh, you know, the lunch that uh, migrants carried with them uh, from the south to the north. Um, and then finally, programs that connect us to community. Yeah, we are Washington, D.C., it's full of everybody, but um, we have a community too. And so we welcomed uh, Chef Rob Harper to the stage um, uh, a few weeks ago for the Foods of Jazz. The museum is a very active jazz history program, and so we combined you know, that with a uh, cooking demonstration. And he cooked up um, three dishes from three different uh, centers of jazz history. Uh, from New Orleans, from Kansas City, and from Harlem. Um, those are the, the dishes that, that he prepared. Um, this program was also attended by uh, some 30 uh, culinary students at uh, DC Central Kitchen. And uh, they were all there kind of seeing, um, you know, Rock, the rock star himself, um, you know, cook, but they were also learning about communicating with the public. Um, and our stage, we were able to um, offer that as kind of a uh, learning experience for them. And they also signed up for our food history newsletter. And I'll tell you how to do that too. Um, so anyway, um, I have tried uh, to show you, uh, give you a taste of how food history at the Smithsonian is not just a niche topic, but a, a generative starting point for discussions uh, about race and gender, innovation, and tradition. Uh, justice, community, family. Uh, we are doing uh, as much as we possibly can. Um, cooking Up History allows us to explore diverse traditions with people who have those personal stories and who can connect their experiences and their knowledge to the larger national narratives. Um, these programs help inspire, inspire people to rethink and reimagine what a museum is and what it can do. Um, we don't claim to have all the answers. We're still working on it uh, because that's the nature of what we do. We're um, really um, trying to uh, develop this dynamic program by being uh, um, open to experimentation. Um, but we, what we are demonstrating is that food can be a very powerful starting point for examining uh, many, many aspects of American history. So I will stop here and look forward to um, uh, our discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paula. And I absolutely recommend signing up for those emails from the, um, the exhibition. I get them all the time, and I love reading them. They're a great, a great break from the work day and a um, way to imagine what else is going on in DC. It's really, really exciting. All right, next up we have Marissa Nicosia, who is an assistant professor of Renaissance literature at Pennsylvania State University Abington College. She's completing a monograph on imagined futures in 17th century English history play and has articles on early modern literature published or forthcoming in Modern Philology, Milton Studies, the papers of the Bibliographical Society of America, and Studies in Philology. Her research has been supported by the Folger Shakespeare Library and the Andrew W. Mellon Founded Fellowship of Scholars in Critical Bibliography at Rare Book School. With Alyssa Connell, Marissa founded the public food history website Cooking in the Archives in 2014, and their site has been featured in the Washington Post, CNN.com, NPR's Talk of Iowa, King Arthur Flowers Sift Magazine, and Frankie Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Marissa. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, I'm going to do the PowerPoint dance. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about Cooking in the Archives, a public history uh, website I launched with Alyssa Connell in 2014 when we were both two English PhD candidates at the University of Pennsylvania and very enthusiastic home cooks. Uh, we set out to find, transcribe, research, and cook recipes from culinary manuscripts in the early modern era. Um, so these are British manuscripts that were produced in households between 1600 and 1800. 
And these recipe manuscripts are very miscellaneous. They contain the medicinal and culinary knowledge for families, particularly very upper class households. And they were used by men and women in those families. So, so far we have cooked and posted 59 recipes, which include a 17th century hot chocolate, 18th century macaroni and cheese, jumbles, uh, a lamb shoulder stuffed with oysters, and a very notorious fish custard. Um, to date, we've had over 150,000 individual viewers to the site, and we've had a lot of profiles in, in news media. We're reaching a lot of people, even though um, in the site we're really posting our first attempts to cook these recipes. It's a kind of lab notebook that's open to a very broad public. Um, we care a lot about making what we're doing, even in a lab notebook state, um, available to the broad public because um, we're working with archives of recipe books that have been previously digitized by major cultural institutions, universities, museums, and libraries. Um, most of our research has been in the digital collections and the physical collections at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries, where we started, and at the Folger Shakespeare Library, where I held a fellowship. Um, but just because something has been digitized professionally and beautifully um, and is freely available on a library website does not mean that it is actually fully accessible to the general public, which is why the guiding principle behind our project has been updating, updating these recipes and providing a different kind of access. And updating means four main things for us. First, it means transcription. Early modern English handwriting is pretty crazy. And um, we're producing a searchable, readable version of the recipe um, that might even help um, a very experienced uh, cook or uh, home cook, historical cook, historical reenactor um, who doesn't have the kind of manuscript training that Alyssa and I have to access a particular text. Um, we also are contextualizing the recipes by uh, dealing with variant spellings, defining uh, obscure techniques, uh, equipment and ingredients. And that contextualizing is a, an act of updating that wouldn't have been necessary for an early modern user of this book. Um, we also write out the, our updated recipes in the format that you would expect if you opened up a cookbook in a Barnes and Noble these days. Um, we have an ingredients section and then a method section. The recipes in early modern manuscripts are usually narrative paragraphs instead of um, divided into this more scientific or modern framework. And finally, our method. We are not striving at all to do the wonderful work that other people are doing in reenacting or hearth cooking or recreating um, these recipes using original techniques. We are using our blenders, we are using our refrigerators, <laughs> we're using our modern ovens, and even, I mean, even modern flour that we're buying from Trader Joe's or somewhere is, is very different than early modern flour. Um, and we have decided to embrace the inauthenticity of what we are doing because it allows for a different kind of access to these foods. Now, I've also been thinking a lot about how this work that I'm doing on Cooking in the Archives is a method for manuscript studies and historical scholarship. Um, this is a dish of Portugal eggs. It's a recipe that's not up on the blog yet. It will be eventually. Um, and I did not understand what this recipe was at all until I went through the process of making it. And I've been really inspired by work coming out of sociology on inactive ethnography or carnal sociology, the work of Loa Quant and Karen Cruello, and also in history, Pam Smith's Making a Knowing Lab at Columbia, where a, a teams of faculty and graduate students are working with a 17th century artisanal manuscript and doing a recreation work there. So this is the recipe for Portugal eggs in the University of Pennsylvania's Kislak Center Manuscript Codex 785. And I'm going to read it. To make Portugal eggs, take a very large dish with a broad brim. Lay in it some Naples biscuit in the form of a star. Then put so much sack into the dish as you think the biscuits will drink up. Then stick them full with little pieces of preserved orange and green citron peel and strew store of French comfits over them of diverse colors. Then butter some eggs and lay them here and there upon the biscuits. Then fill up the hollow places in the dish with several colored jellies and round about the brim thereof lay laurel leaves gilt with leaf gold. Lay them slanting and between the leaves several colored jellies. 
Um, now, this is not actually a Portuguese dish. The cue that it, um, the connection to Portugal is with the sack here, an ingredient of um, kind of sherry fortified wine that was coming into England from Portugal. So there are a number of dishes that have Portugal in the name that are not actually Portuguese. Um, and the other thing I learned when I was investigating this recipe is that it's not actually original to this recipe book at all, this recipe manuscript. It's a verbatim transcription of Hannah Woolley's recipe for Portugal eggs from her 1670 cookbook, The Queen-like Closet. Um, Hannah Woolley was a sort of 18th century lifestyle guru who would give you advice on um, manners, etiquette, and also uh, recipes. Now, um, this was a very popular kind of banqueting dish, this dish of Portugal eggs. It appeared on the menu for James II's coronation. Now, learning all of that helped me understand some of the connections between this particular recipe book and Hannah Woolley's cookbook. There are actually four recipes that are shared between the two, um, but I didn't really understand what this dish was supposed to be until I went about making it. It required six sub-recipes, and I didn't even gild the laurel leaves at all <laughs> before I assembled the dish. So I used two recipes from MS Codex 785 to make the uh, Naples biscuits, the fluffy biscuits that then get soaked in alcohol, um, and to make the jelly I used to kind of fill in between the eggs. I used Hannah Woolley's recipe to coat um, fennel seeds and sugar, French comfits, um, and there are also some there from um, a local shop that I picked up. I used my own uh, tried and true recipe for candying orange peel, and I prepared uh, simple scrambled eggs for my buttered eggs after investigating what they were. Um, once I kind of assembled all of this on the plate, I understood more about the Concordia discourse of this particular banqueting dish within the kind of miscellaneous bounty of the early modern banqueting table. I'd read Ken Albala's work on this, I'd read the recipe, but until I actually went through the process of putting it all together, it didn't fully make sense to me. So, to conclude, recipes are instructions for cooking, and I think that sometimes we can lose sight of that if we're sitting around in the archive reading this rec these recipes in a place where we can't even bring a water bottle <laughs> in with us. And they provide us some profound networks um, insights into the networks of women who were um, keeping these recipes, who were drawing from other sources. This is a book that was probably owned by a woman using sources from a female published uh, cook, Hannah Woolley. And they also help us locate global and local networks of um, people distributing recipes to communities and also um, how ingredients were moving around particular regions and, and globally, either through um, trade and, and or exploitation. So we can't necessarily taste the past. This is a radically inauthentic project in certain ways, but we can um, access the past in different ways by trying to cook it. And furthermore, I think when we share um, the work we're doing, even when it's trial and error, even if it's sort of a lab notebook, we're inviting, um, and we make that public, we're inviting a broader public into a conversation about histories that other institutions are already trying to provide them access to. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marissa. Okay, so this is the fun part. Now, the questions. And um, we have about 15 minutes left in our session. I'm sure we wouldn't have wanted to sacrifice any of the wonderful things that we heard from our speakers, uh, but it does leave, with, leave us with a little bit less time than we might desire. I think we can probably go five minutes over. If people have to leave, we won't um, blame you. But I don't want to push it much longer than that because I don't want to um, hamper the next group from coming in and setting up. So I'm going to try my best to balance a few questions from the audience with a few questions from online. These will be representative rather than comprehensive questions. Um, but I do encourage all of you guys to log on to the Rescue Project's Facebook page, which is public. You don't have to be a Facebook member to look at it. And the conversation, I'm hoping, will continue there um, if you have additional questions that don't get asked today. So, I'd like to open it up to our audience here at Costa first. Any questions from the audience? Maybe I'll look online and see what they have to say. Yeah, go ahead.
Absolutely. I'll just, uh, sorry, Zara, I'm just going to say the question out loud to the audience so that everyone can hear it, if that's okay. So the question was whether or not um, Zara would be interested in sharing some of her assignments online because it's a great way to get students um, involved in the process of writing history and thinking about history and public engagement. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, and what are some of the um, pitfalls as well as the promises of such an assignment? So. Yeah, I'm absolutely happy to share it. In fact, it's a long time that I've been working on this assignment. So, and I do have the step-by-step -step instruction that I gave to you before, so feel free. Um, I can give you the specific link for it if you can search my last name and I'll make sure that you can find it just in that particular link. students who were otherwise in the task transition group or were really enthusiastic about it. So I think it's a great thing. Um, admittedly, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think it's neoliberal because you know so many um, students of color came in in the 1990s and um, the university that I work is like that and I have a lot of students in the Black Lives Matter movement. So I was aware of it before I gave the assignment to you. Yes. If I can kind of follow up on that and, and, and maybe more broadly, um, how do you avoid romanticizing food? Is so warm and fuzzy sometimes that it um, allows us to see the past in ways that are uncomplicated. I mean, I remember when you were talking, you said the students saw this as an antidote to the slave trade. Thank you. So the question, the question was about um, how do we avoid romanticizing the past and making it seem fuzzy and warm um, when, in fact, it was, in many cases, the food that we're talking about, the food cultures that we're talking about, were ugly and exploitative.
and then um, showing them the sharp edges um, around you know, the, the, the core. Um, or maybe it's the sharp core. <laughs> um, for example, um, we did three programs on Thanksgiving traditions. And uh, you know, one was with the National Museum of American Indians uh, chef who um, you know, talked about the Wampanoag uh, traditions. Um, we talked about the deprivations at Plymouth and the starvation and you know, that the, um, you know, the, the mythical Thanksgiving Um, and so we, you know, again, not to traumatize people, but to basically um, show that the, the real story um, is, has many, many different dimensions and emotions depending on, you know, who, who it is and whose dish it is and who is inside and who is not. Um, so that's kind of how we try to do it. Any other questions from the audience? So far from online, we have lots of applause. <laughs> People saying that they've really enjoyed the presentation thus far. No one has any questions per se, so um, don't worry yet about stepping on their toes. But. Uh, I will say we've reached almost 600 people online um, over the course of this conversation, which I think already is a testament to the reach that food has. Um, thank you. Thank you to our panelists, um, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. Even given, given the poor video quality and my amateur videoing. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Not to dominate the discussion, but. Um, Smithsonian Food History Weekend is coming up the last weekend of October. Um, this is our third year. Um, it's October 26th through 28th. This year's theme is Many Flavors, One Nation. And this is um, a, a theme that relates to our new exhibitions that are opening at the end of this month, uh, Many Voices, One Nation, and um, Democracy, the Great Recipe. Um, and so we uh, have postcards here. The Food History Weekend has a day of roundtable discussions. Um, we're putting those together right now. Um, and then a day of a festival where that stage is like busy. All day we are cooking on the stage um, with a lot of people. I would love to tell you some of the people that we've confirmed we're meeting with because <laughs> the, you know, the publicity has to be worked out in a certain way. But I'm telling you, be there. And I think your students, everybody's students should come to this, the round table discussion. We try to have scholars, we have historians, anthropologists, but we also have practitioners um, and um, you know, policy makers who are right there in the middle of Washington, D.C. if you think about you know, people who are grappling with some issues, we, we do. So um, I will leave these next to Amanda's great cookies. <laughs> if you, you know, came in late, you get a cookie, and even if you were right away at 30, you get another cookie. So uh, please, you know, pick them up and come to Food History Weekend. 
Thank you, Paul. That's great. Um, in just the few minutes that we have remaining, I'd invite our panelists. Some of you guys already touched on this in your presentations, but I'm wondering if you could give just a brief example of one person that you reached through the food programming that you do that you know you never would have reached if it hadn't been for the food medium. So I know I'm going to teach a lot of college seniors over the course of my career, but there's definitely like recruiter volume of people who reach on the internet. And um, I just have so many memorable moments of people sending me photos of cooking recipes with their kids, um, of cooking recipe recipes with their classes uh, that have just made every single um, recipe that didn't taste that good. <laughs> um, for me, the semester is when I start teaching students, but um, I began that. My study of food has allowed me to have two different types of conversations with my family um, about um, food and food history that in some way validate their experience. powerful for me about making historic recipes, no matter how much I've adapted them, is, and telling the stories of the people who originated those recipes, is that people will then make the recipes and tell the stories again. I've had, I had a neighbor who made one of Melinda, Melinda Russell's recipes, it was a marble cake, and not, not a chocolate and vanilla, but a spice and lemon marble cake. Uh, she made it for family and then shared Melinda Russell's story uh, about her experience during the Civil War, and, and so, so, so telling um, those stories, and for me that is very important. Um, uh, it's really hard to narrow it down to one person, uh, <laughs> you know, because it's, uh, the people who come to the stage are just from all over the place. Um, I guess there was, uh, you know, one woman who was visiting from New Zealand and, and was here for um, six months with her family and you know coming to our program every Friday became something she really wanted to do and she said this is the way I'm learning about American history and you know, you know to me that was just just wonderful but um, you know the, the students who come the um, our families um, it's just yeah it's, it's hard to narrow it down but yeah. <laughs> wonderful thank you all so much and thank you to our audience both online and in person for joining us on this important event. We really appreciate your ideas and your insights, and please join me in thanking our panel. Have a great conference. And I am going to come around with cookies, so if you didn't get a jumble, please. I don't want to take these back to Washington. <laughs>